Hi guys, remember me? I'm Carrie. Nose. Help. First of all, if you're interested in machine learning, you gotta check out Siraj Raval, who's also got a YouTube channel dedicated to teaching artificial intelligence stuff. He's got an actual degree in computer science and I don't, so that tells you something. And he makes videos like this. Hello world, it's Siraj, and welcome to Intro to Deep Learning. In this first episode, we'll predict an animal's body weight given only the weight of its brain. You mean this thingy? Yeah, uh-huh, you know what it is. <laughs> Link in the description. Anyway, today I'm gonna try to get my computer to replicate my voice. Spoiler, you won't be impressed. Before we move on, I already know I'm gonna get a lot of comments like, This has already been done before! And, Somebody else got successful results with a different method, so your method is not worth trying. And to that I respond, yeah. I admit I'm not the first person to try something like this. YouTubers Something Unreal and John Reeveman have already posted impressive results of computers using neural networks to imitate human voices. And Google itself has tackled this task too, with Google DeepMind's WaveNet program producing better text-to-speech results than any other TTS system in the world. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. <laughs> also, really advanced text-to-speech systems like Siri or Amazon Alexa aren't really comparable here. Aren't comparable? What the hell do you mean by that, you little bitch? Because those systems are already given which phonetic sounds and words to say. In addition, they probably use pre-recorded samples from human speaking, which is like cheating. The point of my project, and all the projects I'm mentioning here, is that the computer has to produce voice-like sounds without directly being taught concepts like words, grammar, and voice inflection. It all has to arise organically. So there, I won't shy away from the fact that I'm not the first. But hey, my goal is not to beat literally Google at their specialty. It's just to tinker around, have fun, and learn a little by building everything behind the scenes. But not really. And about me using an unconventional method, I think that's actually a good thing. Because we as a community learn more about what works and what doesn't. But Gary! What? What is your unconventional method? I'm glad you asked. See, the three people I mentioned earlier all used recurrent neural Google networks- Google isn't a person! What was that? Google is not a person! You think I didn't know that? Well, you said three people! The three entities I mentioned earlier all used recurrent neural networks applied to raw audio samples, which just means each sample was being produced one at a time. And considering that there are anywhere from 11,000 to 16,000 to 48,000 samples per second, they are going to have to go through a lot of steps just to produce a small amount of audio. Not only will that take a long time, I heard that WaveNet takes 90 minutes to produce one second of audio, but it also strains the computer's ability to remember past events and discover patterns. But I mean, let's be clear, these downsides must not be too serious if Google was still able to produce bleeding edge technology with them, right? So maybe I'm just overreacting. But I am not Google, so I have less brain power and less computer power. For the fun of it, let's try a different approach. Enter the spectrogram, one of the most simple intuitive representations of sound known to humankind and now you. I just realized that implies you aren't a human, but I mean that's not surprising, just look at you. It's a two-dimensional heat map of sorts, where right and left mean forward and backward in time, and up and down mean higher and lower in pitch. Lighter colors mean stronger vibrations at that frequency at that time, and darker colors mean weaker vibrations. If you've watched some of my older videos, you might be thinking, You've already used spectrograms two times, this is nothing new. Well, I see your point. Those images were not true spectrograms. Why? Well, they could only depict notes coming from one instrument, and in my mind, true spectrograms should be able to represent any sound in the world. That means your mind is dumb. With spectrograms, one second of audio can now be summed up with just 100 samples, instead of several thousand. This will make pattern recognition easier, but on the other hand, we've also got a whole new dimension to deal with. Also, we can't perfectly reconstruct audio out of this, but we can get kind of close. Just listen. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Take two carry here, 
I spent over 10 minutes talking about the science of spectrograms, but I am just not willing to animate 18 minutes for one video. If you guys want to hear that without the visuals anyway, just let me know. Unrelated, but can I just point out how innocently sweet and naive Take One Carry is? So ignorant of the future, hee <laughs> hee. To summarize, I want to hear my computer imitate my human voice. I, I say human voice as if I've got some other non-human voice. So here's my game plan. 10 Words of Wisdom is the most mind-blowing, life-changing experience on this website, but it also happens to be a great source for training data. From it, I was able to extract just under 4 hours of raw audio of me speaking in a natural voice. I have an IQ of you plus 22, boo-boo. In a semi-natural voice. In Python, I divvied these 4 hours into 11,168 snippets, each 1.28 seconds long. There's this program called the Analysis and Resynthesis Sound Spectrograph, written by Michael Ruzik in 2008. Basically, ARSS is a program that can listen to any wave file and draw its corresponding spectrogram by figuring out what frequencies are vibrating at what time. On his website, Michael Ruzik lists some cool experiments he's tried. Some of these experiments are only possible when you play with the image files instead of audio files, including time-stretching audio. <laughs> Time squishing audio, stretching pitch intervals, turning real world images into sound, and even converting an image of Lena into sound and then back into Lena. But anyway, the main reason why I love R so much... <sighs> Can we start over? The reason why I chose ARSS, even though it's such old software, is that it's the only program I could find that could be called from the terminal, allowing me to call it from Python. And it can convert from raw audio into spectrogram image and backwards, though not perfectly for some reasons I described in the 10 minute blurb I cut out. Anyway, I'm going to set up ARSS with the parameters of 100 pixels per second and 24 pixels per octave, giving us 128 by 128 pixel images. Small enough for Hypergant to train fast, but big enough to depict what's being said. But barely. Okay, to be honest, the resolution's so low that the audio reconstruction barely sounds like me. It means you guys will be eliminated. It means you guys will be eliminated. But hey, lo-fi music is back in fashion these days. Question, why did I choose a frequency range of 180 to 7000 Hz if my voice is only about 130 Hz? Yes, this is 130 Hz. The answer is that I initially took a wider frequency range of my voice, but I wanted to cut out all the stuff that didn't look useful for articulating the sounds. Only this stuff looked useful to me. Wow, you're being real scientific right there. Remember, I'm a tinkerer, not a researcher. I do this to have fun, not to expand humanity's knowledge. Here's my Python code, by the way. Also, there's this weird trick where you can still hear the fundamental frequency of a sound even when you can only hear the overtones. Check it out. One hundred hertz isn't playing, but can you hear it anyway? Here it is. This means that even if my voice's frequency is technically out of the range of this image, you'll still be able to hear it because its overtones are in range. Back to my game plan. I fed the 11,000 images as training data into Hypergan, which simply speaking is a program that looks at thousands of images from the outside world during its training session, and then uses deconvolutional neural networks to generate new images in the same style as the originals. You guys have heard me talk about this relentlessly in previous videos, but if you haven't, check the description. Let's have Hypergan train on its own but stop it every 6 minutes to hear how it's doing. Hypergan's gonna give us images back, but we can convert those images into audio almost instantaneously by using ARSS. So without further ado, here is the beginning of Hypergan's attempt to sound just like me. So yeah, it sounds pretty bad, but I gotta show you what square 1 sounded like, so you can appreciate it more when we get to square 2.
Sounds like lasers, doesn't it? Speaking of lasers, check out my laser songs. I'm such a sellout. You might have noticed these images have color in them, which means there's three output color channels, whereas the desired spectrogram images are only grayscale. Why didn't I edit Hypergant's code to only output one color channel instead of three? Do I have some innovative reasoning behind it? The answer is no. I'm just too dumb and scared to change any of Hypergan's code. I've subjected you to a lot of non-human laser sounds, but I promise things are about to change. And just like that, a muffled, somewhat metallic human voice comes out of thin air. It's not great, and you can't even make out any words I'm saying. But what's spooky is, you can kinda tell it's me. Progress slowed down a lot after the first night, so I'm going to skip forward like 20 hours to show you what the final results are. There it is, those are my final results. Like I warned, you're probably not too impressed. But audio definitely cleaned up a bit since 20 hours ago. There's less of that constant buzzing background noise than before, which you can also see visually by the background becoming darker. But that watery metallic distortion of my voice itself never went away. And I don't think it could ever go away. Again, that's because the image dimensions are so low, and ARSS as a program can't reconstruct audio with perfect fidelity. With that all being said, I do think my methodology has some benefits over the work of Something Unreal and John Reeveman. Not Google DeepMind though, Google DeepMind's unbeatable. So because my base unit of time was the pixel at one hundredth of a second, whereas the other two's base unit of time was the audio sample at one eleven thousandth of a second, my program was able to learn long-term patterns like voice inflection and sentence starts and stops better. At the beginning, you can hear something Unreal and John Reeveman's LSTM getting stuck on single phonetic sounds for ages. Since one vibration in that phonetic sound already takes up several hundred steps a long time in the RNN's eye. I suppose this is pretty obvious, but on one hand, the neural nets looking at the microscopic level do better on the microscopic level, with crisp, enunciated sounds. It's because that crispness relies on a few of those audio samples right on the transitions of sounds being just right. On the other hand, neural nets looking at the macroscopic level do better on the macroscopic level, with my generated audio generally getting the flow of sentence intonation sounding about right. I would say their neural networks sound like a person with a stutter talking just inches away from you, whereas my neural network sounds like a person speaking coherently but standing behind iron doors and underwater. Of course, I'd be able to say that a little more confidently if I could generate samples longer than 1.28 seconds. So I guess the video is just about over. Maybe I could talk about ways to improve this voice generation. I'm feeling a little wary of Hypergan at this point, because even though it creates images super fast, Hypergan can't understand the passage of time or cause and effect, which means it'll only be able to generate audio as long as the samples I feed into it. It'll never be able to ramble on indefinitely. Alternatives to Hypergan that maybe could ramble indefinitely are Pixel CNN, which produced that exquisite jazz music but is slow to generate, and maybe WaveNet's TensorFlow implementation modified to create images. Because WaveNet on raw audio has proven to be so, so, so extremely successful, I just wonder what would happen if it could be used to work on spectrograms. The only downside is we've got a whole nother dimension to work with now, but hey, computers love dimensions, don't they? No, they don't. That's it for now. 
Thank you, patrons. You guys are super cool. See you viewers next time. Oh wait, two more announcements. One, if you want to see sloppier videos from me, including a video that's literally 1,000th the length of this one, check out my new second channel called Humany. And two, Computery thinks I hog up too much of the spotlight and wants to do the outro for once. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.